pretty happy baby, I was told, now I'm all solemn and I don't want to smile and stuff like that, all that kind of stuff. Um, I started off my school, kindergarten, first grade, in a private school called Answorth, uh, which no longer exists. It's now some sort of military something or other. So it went from a school to military, kind of crazy. Um, and, you know, I've been told that the most important years of your life are like 12 through 15, because that's when you find yourself and all this kind of stuff. But I think it's when you first start school, because it's something completely different, something completely you're not used to, you know? Um, so I went to this private school, and the first two years of school experience, and you know, everything in private school is stand up straight, put your arms behind your back, like you're being arrested, but it's nice. It's like a nice version of setting you up to be arrested. But everything's proper, everybody looks down like this over their nose, you know, you get used to that, your neck hurts after a while, but you get used to it. So, second grade, I went to this magical jungle called public school, and public school is so far different than private school to me. I mean, you got kids running around with scissors, eating glue, fighting each other, and then it's like, fend for yourself, the lunch cafeteria is over, well, you're not gonna walk me to the cafeteria? No, man, you gotta fight off the fifth graders to get there. You know, it's, it's a completely different world. So I didn't have very many friends because I'm used to private school. I'm not used to public school. I didn't make any friends at Bowder, second grade. Third grade, I went to Ridgecrest. Oh, which me is where... too. I went there. Who did? I you went there, Okay. <laughs> went to Ridgecrest. Yeah, Gina right. knows. Yeah. That's where they put all the smart, intelligent people. Wait a second, Gina went there? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that, Gina. I'm not saying that. I know, I know, I know. So, that's where they put all the smart people. So, evidently, I'm smart. And went there. I know, you're still so smart. So, went there to third through fifth grade. Made about 15 friends total over those three years. <laughs> Not kidding, like 15 friends. That's a lot of friends. And then I went to Osceola Middle School while all my yeah. other friends went up to... Yeah! yeah. Chiefs, yeah, something to be proud about. No, well I went to Osceola Middle School and all my friends went North what? County. They went... What's up? Shh. I know you did. I got you. So anyway... Uh, all my friends went North County. They went Palm Harbor, Tarpon Springs, East Lake, like, like way away. So I didn't have any friends going into school. And I was bullied constantly when I was in sixth grade because I was a fat, smart kid that nobody wanted to hang out with. I sat alone at lunch. I had like three friends by the end of sixth grade year. And one of those friends, I don't know if you know him or not, his name is Ryan Schuler. And I think he's sitting in that back row over there. Hey, I'd, I'd like to put you on the spot. So anyway. This was the kid that kept doing this to me every week. Hey, man. What? Hey, man. What? Come to church with me. No, man, I'm not. Church is weird. I'm not about church. Church is weird. And so after about a year of, hey, man. Hey, man, go to church with me. Hey, man, go to church with me. I was like, you know what, Ryan? I'll go to church with you. How about that? I'll go to church with you, and you can never ask me again. He's like, all right, man, but I guarantee you're going to want to come back. I said, okay, whatever. I ended up coming back. Right, here I am. This is not my second time. I did come back between then and now. Anyway, um, and the God thing wasn't for me, but I liked it because there was cheap food and cool people. I'm being honest. I'm not going to lie and say I got it from the beginning, because I didn't. So there was this, and I always had a problem fitting in. I became a follower not of Christ, but of other people. And the first group that I found that fit in was, you know, they were, they were a small group, but they were a group. But the problem was they all had bad home lives. And, you know, the, this person doesn't have one parent. This person doesn't have both parents. They're a drug problem. One family, they're moving from house to house. They're homeless. And that's horrible. I don't wish that upon anybody, ever. But I don't have that problem. So in order to fit in with this group, I found things wrong with my life. I found things that were not supposed to be blown out of proportion. The extent of my troubles in my home life were my mom would come home, I'd be on my Xbox, and she'd say, why don't you take the trash out? Why don't you do the dishes? And so me trying to make my life horrible, I go, fine, mom, I'm the worst kid in the world. Why don't I just go die? <laughs> Over dishes and trash. <laughs> That's what my problem was. So, in order to 
fit in with these kids, that's what I had to do. And more and more I started feeling this emptiness inside me. Like there was something missing. And I just, you know, I told myself, you know, I'm just, I, I don't know, man, I just feel horrible all the time. I don't get it. There's nothing worth living for. You know, maybe I should, maybe I should cut myself. Maybe I should drink. Maybe I should smoke to get rid of this pain, this emptiness I'm feeling that I was creating to myself. I was manufacturing this emptiness. And then I told myself one day, why don't I just end it? Why don't I just get rid of myself? I'm a problem. But then I realized I'm not a problem. There's something worth living for. There's some, there's some purpose for me here. I just didn't know what at the time. So let me get into some of the trials that I've been through. I started cursing at a real young age because the, the coolest kid in Ridgecrest cursed like a sailor. So I was like, man, if I'm going to be cool, i got to curse, man. i got to really, really be nasty and mean with my words. That's what i got to do. That's cool. So by 12, I had, uh, let me think of a uh, comedian you guys would know, Daniel Tosh. That was my vocabulary. And if you know who Daniel Tosh is, at 12 years old, I should have been drowned with soap. Washed my mouth out daily with soap because that is filthy. So I hung around. I got out of the group where everybody's life was terrible, and then I moved into the group with potheads, druggies, dropouts, um, just people that are not really generally considered good influences. And I never really got wrapped up in what they did, but I still, you know, I pretended like a guy would be like, hey man, did you smoke yesterday? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I smoke every day, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, smoke daily, blow it, blaze it up 420, you know. Never, never got into the stuff, but I had to pretend I did to fit into this group. But every time I pretended, I still felt empty. I still had that hurt in my heart that I was empty. And then the first real, real hard hit hit me. Boom. Dad's in a medically induced coma. Breathing through a tube, eating through a tube. He's not awake. Now, background, he went in for a hernia operation. They put a piece of mesh in his stomach. The mesh got infected, and he went septic. And if you know what septic means, it means you got about a 5% chance of living if you go full septic. He had that 5% chance of living. But my family did such a good job of making it look like he was just in the hospital for a little bit. I never really, never dawned on me that he was this close from being dead for like a week. Because you never really think about somebody that important in your life dying. It just never dawns on you that that could happen. But he got better, thank God. But although medical professionals and surgeons who had done these surgeries thousands of times said it was a miracle, it was a work of God that he got better, he didn't take it that way. He just thought, well, I got better. I just did. So, never really changed my perception of God. And time passed by, everything was whatever, still kind of hurting inside. And then the second hit, my uncle got leukemia. The rarest, not rarest, but the most deadly form of leukemia. But, he also had a chromosome that was so rare, but knocked the cancer out. Helped knock the cancer out. So he's clean, he's done with that, and he became a man of God. That's when it started to run in my head that maybe I should run that route instead of just assuming that, oh, he got better. Maybe there was a reason he got better. But through all these major and minor struggles, you know, from the, the cancer in the family and, the, and the, the coma that my dad was in to just getting yelled at for this, yelled at for that, I just, I just felt more and more empty. And it took me about three years to really start listening to what JP was saying, to listen to what uh, JJ, and if you don't know who JJ is, he's the old youth pastor here, you probably heard the stories, him, Pastor Tom, all of them were saying, I didn't start listening until about three years ago. I used to show up, hang out for a month, for a week, a month, then not show up for three months just because I didn't want to. And I really noticed that I was a part of this family, and I say family with the best meaning possible because you guys are a family. I really noticed I was part of this family when I got messages on Facebook asking me where I was, why I wasn't at Pipeline, that everybody missed me. 
And that never really happened before. I never really had somebody that was like, I missed you. I missed your presence. So why aren't you here? And that's when it dawned on me that these people cared about me. So maybe I should go back a couple times. So I went on this thing called Winter Retreat, if you know about it. And the last night that we were there, I saw so many people moved by God at the same time that I just said, you know what? There's no way that I can deny this any longer, that, this, that, that God is real and that God, he's the answer. I can't keep looking for answers when he, it's right in front of me and I'm just trying to push it to the side and look for it. So I finally accepted Jesus. I finally accepted God. And I'm not ashamed anymore. I'm not afraid to tell people when they ask me, what are you doing Wednesday nights? I go to youth ministry. I go to Pipeline. I go to church because I love Jesus. I don't say, well, I got a, I got a prior engagement with a couple of select people, and I like to talk to them about stuff. And we talk about feelings and stuff. You wouldn't like it now. <laughs> it's not like that anymore. What do you say? What do you mean? No, I, I don't know, man. I, I, never, I, I don't know. I never really paid attention to it, but thank you for letting me know. But I got beat up. This kid is a miracle worker. <laughs> so every trial that I went through, I thought about it. I always blamed God. I always questioned God. Were you really that bored? You had nothing better to do? You had to put this bus in front of me? You had to put this old lady from Ontario in the left turn lane with the right turn lane from on, on, 10 under? Making me late for wherever I'm going? You were that bored? He's like, I, I imagine he was up there going, watch this, come here, come here, come here. Moses, come here, watch this. <laughs> Look at that bus. Look, he can't get out. Look, there's a construction truck on this side. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> this is great. This is quality entertainment. But you know what? My uncle really put it in perspective of me. In perspective of me. In perspective to me. He said, you know what, you know that guy in front of you that's hitting his brakes every five seconds? Do you want to go and just destroy his car, take his driver's license, snap it in half, just get angry at him? I said, yeah. He says, that's not him, that's Satan. I said, no, he's just a crappy driver. Let's just put the facts out there. He's just not a good driver. He says, no, think about it. When a little kid is standing over here going, hey, look at me. Look at me, look at what I'm doing over here. I'm doing jumping jacks because that's what little kids do. And you're standing over here and you're like, no, don't worry about it, man. You're cool, whatever. Just don't, you just don't pay any attention to him. And then he goes, oh, yeah, watch this. Knocks a vase off here, throws this over here, bites somebody, goes after somebody. And you got to turn around and go, okay, no, 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 it's okay. Don't do that. Don't do that. Satan's the same exact way. He's no better than a little child. He wants to get your attention and make you imperfect and just make you, come on, come on, get mad at that. Cuss him out. Hit that horn. Please, please, please. For the love of God, no pun intended, hit that horn. Get mad at him. Give in to this temptation. He wants to make you realize you're not perfect and make you feel guilty for it. Because as soon as I would hit that horn, I'd be like, I shouldn't have done that. That guy's not happy. Maybe he has somewhere to be, too. He just wants to take his time getting there. <laughs> if you open your Bibles real quick to uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, I have, I have a couple verses here, uh, not very many, but I do have a couple, so I'll wait for a second. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah, like three Bibles are open, cool. 1 <laughs> Peter what? 5, 8, and 9. Verse Peter. Five. Okay, I have the wrong. Eight, nine. Are you talking about verses or chapters? Chapter five. Yeah. Verse eight, nine. Okay, thank you. Sorry. You said seven and six. Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Okay, so New Living Translation says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering that you are. Well, think about that for a second. He'll tempt you and he'll try to bring you down 
but it's not God doing it. So don't question God when it's really Satan. Realize it's Satan and rise above it. Don't give in to that temptation. Things might get nasty. They might make you upset. They may bring you down to a lower low than you've ever known. But don't turn on God. Because it's not his doing. I mean, you just have to, you have to hang in there. And from the outside, I know that's easy to say. Because I don't know your story. I don't know your struggles. But you have to hang in there. Now, if you have your Bibles open still, because you should... Go to 1 Peter 5.10. I know it's a long, you know, flipping pages, or just, you know, going a verse down, but I'll give everybody a second. I'm just going to Bible. Thanks, Christian. <coughs> Christian, the official timer of Stephen speaking. 1 Peter what? Wait. 5. Verse 10. Okay, of what? 1 Peter. 1 Peter. It's right here, okay? You guys going to share? Okay, all right, all right. First Peter 5. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by the means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered for a little while, he will restore support and strengthen you, and he'll place you on a firm foundation. So guys, you follow Christ, you follow God, and he's going to take all those burdens, all those struggles away from you, and put you on solid ground that you're not afraid to walk on, that you're not... You don't, you don't think about how horrible your life is. You don't give in to those, that guy from Ontario. You just do. And you, you glorify God in everything you do as often as you possibly can. Think about it. There are people in this world who have nothing. Right? It's a, it's a well-known fact, unfortunately. Now, next time you think to yourself that you have a horrible life, ask yourself a couple questions. Do I have a home? Do I have loving family members of some sort or guardians that are providing this home for me? Is my iPhone charged? Do I have an Xbox sitting under my TV in my bedroom or in my living room? Do I have a Game Boy? Yes. You know I'd get you somewhere. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's Yeah. yeah. Also ask yourself, have I ever starved? Am I wearing clothes? Am I wearing shoes? Am I living pretty comfortably? If you've answered yes to some, if not all, of these questions, you have it better than most people in the world, including your fellow Christians. I know people who have nothing, who ride their bikes around the county all day, who have cardboard signs saying, please help me. And in one particular... Uh, instance, there's a guy in East Bay and Starkey who has a bike and a trailer for his dog. Guy's homeless. He takes his dog with him. And on the back of the trailer, it's got a cardboard and it changes every three or four months. I couldn't really remember what the last one was. It was from Corinthians, but he has a Bible verse on it. And I asked the guy, I said, how do you, how do you have such a strong faith? How do you maintain this faith when you have nothing? And he says, but I do have something. I have faith in Jesus. I have faith in God. And let me ask you a question. If it's so easy for him to put everything he has in God, when he has nothing, when he has a miserable life, why is it so hard for some of you to do it? Why is it such a struggle? And that might be a struggle that you have in and of itself, that you're struggling to put God in front, to put God ahead of what you, you as a person might be struggling with or have problems with temptation. You can have your problems. I understand it. You all have your problems. Everybody has a problem. But you can't blame God. And you, you can't think of, of self-harm, of drugs, or promiscuity, or any other sinful tendency because none of those are going to fix what's broken, what's, what's missing, what your struggles are, what you're tempted with. None of those are going to fix it, but Jesus will. And you need to remember that. He's the only one who can release those burdens, lift them off your shoulders. In conclusion, 
I no longer feel empty. I feel like my life has purpose. I'm a genuinely happier person. I like to think. I don't know about other people, but I like to think so. I won't go back to that dark place I was in that I partially created because it was horrible. And it's because the emptiness that I had was filled with Jesus. Nothing else. I did not feel any sort of satisfaction more than when I accepted Christ. There's no amount of money, drugs, sex, friends, followers on Instagram, followers on Twitter that are going to fill that void. You're still going to feel empty in the end. So let's go one more verse. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. I'll give you a minute on that one, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Taking you into the camera. Yeah, I got you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Matthew 11, what, what's 28 and 29. What's what? Promiscuity. Promiscuity. Yeah. It's... it's Basically, uh, it, it's, I don't know. <laughs> I'm never going to be a fifth grade teacher, I can tell you that. Oh, yeah, you get yeah. you get what I'm saying there, right? Yeah, yeah, good. Awkward! Oh, so with an E? What? <laughs> oh, drugs! No! Um, oh, really? Yes. Sure, um, well, um. I'll tell you later. Yeah, there you go. JP oh, will oh, tell you later. I got that one. I, yeah. Do you? <laughs> Okay, I'm just making sure. Right now. I'm not really concerned about you, but... Okay, so, back to the verse. Matthew 11, 28, 29. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So, no matter how heavy your burden is, no matter how how much you struggle, or how much you're tempted, as long as you remind yourself that you have Jesus, there's no burden, no struggle, no temptation that's going to rise above that. There's no way. So, I challenge you. Can you ask God to fill that emptiness that you're feeling in your heart? I also want to challenge you to bring someone who's struggling with you next week, the week after, as soon as you can get them here, as long as they get here. Because I've seen broken and misguided people be rebuilt and guided in front of me in this room. God can rebuild them. He can put them on the right track. And I would know because I was misguided. So just keep that in mind whenever you're feeling down, whenever you're struggling, whenever you're feeling tempted by something. Because I promise. There's no better feeling in the world to know that you have your Savior behind you. So, JP, if you would, can you close out on prayer? Because I'm not really good at that stuff. I can do it, buddy. <laughs> Let's give uh, Super Adam. Uh, Super Adam. Super Adam. Let's give Seth a second. Do you want to, you want to close this in prayer? Yeah? All right. Let's, let's pray. Father God, um, I just wish that, you know, all the burdens in our life can be freed and we can release Jesus, or we can release Satan from us so that we can live a Jesus life and just follow Jesus. I mean, just... All of Jesus, just do what you need to do. All right. Amen. It's good stuff, brother. I enjoyed that. Sorry, we need to live a Jesus life. You know, guys, I'm gonna take just a few seconds because uh, Steve killed it. So um, I got nothing else to say besides this. He was talking, and it's always besides this. I'm a pastor. I have to be able to talk. Yeah. Besides this, I want to share some scripture with you uh, that Steve kind of was talking about in his life, about being misguided and, 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 and trying to get involved in things that weren't good. And, and you could see the genuine 
love that Christ has on him because he's been he's been challenged by that and he's been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says something right there at the very end about inviting out a friend who's broken. Listen, that's such an important thing because you guys as students, as believers, are the hands and feet of God. It's our responsibility to share our love with the broken people. And we have a way of fixing that. It's like we're doctors and we have the the flu vaccine or whatever vaccine. We have the way to save somebody's life from eternal death, but yet we're holding it to ourselves. In America, if a doctor had a cure to a disease that would save billions of people, he would go to jail if he didn't want to share that. There would be a, that would be it. His life would be over. So think about that. We have the opportunity to save millions and billions of people from eternal death, and we should share that. As he was talking, I found this great scripture in Psalms 3. I just want to read it to you. This is David. He's, he's running again. He's being chased around. Uh, if you don't know David, he was, he was a, a man who, who ran a lot. He was really on the run quite a bit. Um, yeah, that's right. There he is. He's always running. I want to read this scripture to you because it's something that was very powerful to me. It's, it says, Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. But, oh Lord, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and he has answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and I sleep, yet I wake up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I am not afraid of tens of thousands of enemies who surround me on every side. Arise, O oh Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. And yes, I did say slap your enemies in the face. Because <laughs> that's what the Bible said. So. <laughs> Listen, we have power. Listen, Steve said it. Many of us are empty. We're empty. And we, we don't know what to do about it. We are empty, and we fill our voids. We try to fill our lives with stuff to make us feel full. But what keeps happening over and over again, like a car, is you fill it full of fuel, and you drive it, and it gets empty again. And then you have to go and you have to fill it full of fuel again, and you drive it, and it gets empty again. And a lot of, a lot of you, that's exactly what you're in life right now. You're finding new things to fill yourself up so that way you can keep going, but eventually you drain out. And then you have to find another thing to fill yourself up and keep going and you drain yourself out. Jesus tells us that come to him and he is the life. He is the, the way, the truth. He had never ending just fountain of, of life. He calls us to do that. So I encourage you guys over this next week, think a lot about what Steve said because he hit it right on the head. It's Jesus. It's all Jesus. You have the cure. You have the knowledge I'm sure most of us in this room would all come to the agreement that we understand that Jesus is our Savior. I think we all understand that. So because you know that, you now have the responsibility to share that with somebody broken. I'm sure many of you have a friend who comes to you constantly who is hurting, who is broken, who comes to you for comfort, who comes to you for advice. And I'm pretty sure you're not saying, you know what, I know what you need. How about you come with me? You know what, I know. I know why you're suffering. You feel empty, right? You feel like you're lost, right? Like there's no purpose in your life? Well, I know it will give you purpose. We have that, that fix. We, we have that ability to do that. So Steve, man, again, you did a killer job, bro. Way to just share God's word. Thank you.